Okay, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to see you again for the second. Okay, I see the meeting is now being recorded. Okay, can you see my screen? Can you see my share? Maybe last time I think there was a problem with recording. Something didn't seem to work properly, but I hope it's okay now. Okay. Uh, yeah. You get a car, recording SMP, you hold up. Pierre's here, you know, bigger the car, you know, see my sheep. Oh, okay, okay. Now, only I'm talking about. Oh, you know, but we will. Only I'm okay. So let's begin with this session. Uh, we're already three minutes into the time. Maybe more people will show up. Later. So today's topic, some general. Hello. Okay, maybe you should turn off your microphones if you're not asking questions. Thank you. So today's topic, role of language in society. We will look at some general things, general observations today. And then on Wednesday, we will apply this to what's going on in Myanmar and societies of Myanmar. Some keywords first to give you an idea what I'm going to talk about in the next 45 to 50 minutes. I want to have a look at identity. What does identity mean? Who are we? Who do we define ourselves? Then, of course, identity is linked to community. It's linked to society, nationality. And then what still seems to be an important notion in Myanmar and other Southeast Asian countries is race. Race is not really used in European societies that much. Uh, we will look at this especially next lesson on Wednesday. In terms of language, we will have a look at idiolect, sociolect, and dialect differences, and also the role of a standard language. Why do we have a standard language? And this whole is about language and culture, and also language and thinking. Culture is very much part of the way how we think. So first, language and identity. Identity. Let's start with an example. And example, well, let's do it the easy way for me, as I'm uh, from Switzerland, native from Switzerland. So a very common question when you meet people is, where are you from? Where do you come from? Like in Burmese, when you meet new people, you usually ask, so it seems to be very important where we are from. Now, what you see here is a map of Switzerland with the different cantons, as we call them, provinces or regions. In Myanmar, you would call it regions now. So the different colors are different provinces of Switzerland. Now, in my case, I was born in this little town of Hur, which is in the eastern part of Switzerland. But I grew up mostly in the biggest city of Switzerland, in Zurich. So where am I from? What is my identity? Who am I? If people, if I, I'm in Zurich and people ask me, where are you from? Of course, I would refer to my native area although I never lived there. 
I was born there, but it is not where I grew up. I grew up in this area. But still for people where I live now in Zurich, I can say I come from Kur. I come from this province of the Grisons in the East. So this is part of my identity to be from there. But of course, when I travel in Europe, when I go to France, for example, you see here the map of Europe with Switzerland in red. And I go to France, people ask me, where are you from? I would just say, I'm from Switzerland. So my identity then is Swiss and not from a special town or region in Switzerland. Now, here you have the world map with the little red dot in the middle, which is Switzerland. Very small country, no access to the sea, to the ocean in the middle of Europe. When I was a young student, when I was 17 years old, I spent one year in Thailand, neighboring country of Myanmar, as you all know. So when I was in Thailand, of course, I still was Swiss, but people in Thailand don't call me Swiss. They call me Farang. So Farang is the general word for people from Europe or from the West, like white people with big noses. That's Farang. So I got a new identity there being Farang. So what I want to show with this is that our identity is not something that is fixed. It's not something that we are for always and ever. It can change. It can be different in different situations. Now, when I meet people from place where I was born, where my family is from, I would speak the dialect of this area. This is the dialect that we speak in the family, dialect of this area. But when I meet people from other areas, at the provinces, I rather speak a more neutral variety of the same language. So I leave away two specific local words. But then when I meet people from other countries, not from Switzerland, maybe from other countries in Europe or anywhere in the world, I would rather speak standard German or English or some other shared language. So I would use an international language, an international communication. This in linguistics is called a lingua franca. Lingua franca is a language that is used by people speaking different native languages in order to communicate in a broader area. So I would use different languages or different varieties of the language in different contexts. And this also means that my different identities, my different levels of identity are linked to different ways of expressing myself in a language. Now, some more abstract facts about language and identity, just basic facts. A language is a means or can be a means, can be a way to express your identity. And the language can be used to show that you belong to a certain group. So if I speak my native language, I show that I belong to this group of people from this area. But of course, language and identity are not something that are innate. Children do not, are not born with a certain language or identity, but rather they acquire the language and identity of their environment, of their surroundings. So children learn the language from their family or village or 
environment and then they build their identity around this society or within this society. Now, we can argue that language is the most important part of our culture. Human culture would not be possible without language. Basically, everything we do, we do with language. We use language. We use language to communicate. We use language to write stories, poems, songs. We use language to coordinate work. So language is probably the most important, the most intimate part of our culture. Now, this does not mean, of course, that children can learn only one language. That doesn't mean that we are restricted to only one language so that we have one culture. We can learn many, many languages at the same time, especially children are very good at that. Then what is also important, as I is not fixed and our language is not fixed. Who we are, that may change depending on the context. And this also changes throughout one's lifetime. I don't have the same identity that I had 20 years ago or I had 40 years ago. And probably I will not be the same person in 10 years. Also the language that I use changed a lot. When I was 10 years old, basically I spoke only Swiss and German and some French. Now I speak many other languages as well. So my language in general changed. Also, if you speak only one language, this language will change throughout your lifetime. Maybe you don't speak the same way that you spoke 10 years ago. So this is not something that is fixed. Language and identity are fluid. They can change and they do change. And also any person can at the same time have different identities. So all of you at some time or at some times are, have the identity of son and daughter. In other contexts, you may be friends with someone, or you may be teachers or students. You may be customers if you go to a shop. This is all different identities that you have. And you feel different, probably. You behave differently if you are in the role of a son from the time when you're in the role of a friend. So with your friends, you behave differently. And I would say you also speak differently. And that's the important thing for this lecture. Your different identities are linked to different languages or variants of the language. Your different identities are expressed by different ways of how you speak. And so here we have these uh, common terms in linguistics. We speak of idiolects, sociolects, and dialects. An idiolect is the way one individual person speaks the language. And this may be different from everyone else. All of you may, even in your native language, you may speak a bit differently from other people around you. You may pronounce a few words a bit differently. You may use some words in another way. So this is your idiolect. Idio means own. And lect is the way we speak. Then sociolect is the variety of a language spoken by a group of people. So you may have a sociolect spoken by students in Mandalay, for example. Students in Mandalay may speak differently from people working on the market in Mandalay. And they may speak differently from students in Yangon or Downji or anywhere else in the country. So the sociolect is the dialect, the variety of a language spoken 
by some part of the society. And especially social acts are important for group building. With your social act, you can express to which group you belong. And then dialects, we usually take to be varieties of a language spoken in a certain region. So you have a dialect of Mandalay in Burmese, and you have dialect of Yangon and Malamyang and Daungji. These are different varieties of the same language of Burmese. Usually you can still understand each other if you speak different dialects. But still the dialect that you speak shows you to belong to a certain group. It shows part of your identity as belonging to a certain region of the country. So language and identity are linked and they're fluid. Now, similar to a person who can have different identities and use different languages, a whole society can use different languages or varieties of the same language in different contexts. Many nations, many countries do have one or more standardized national language or languages. Like in English, you have a way that is given by school education. You have a way how to speak and write proper English. Again, this is the prescriptive way of doing linguistics. The standardized national language is the language which is used in most official contexts like education, in government administration, in the media, newspapers, books, will usually be written in a standardized language with a standardized orthography, way of writing. But besides this standardized language, most people will also use some sort of vernacular variety. Vernacular is popular colloquial variety of a language. And this is what you use in everyday communication. So in English, the way you speak may not be the same as the way you write. When you speak, you say things like, I don't like it. Don't is not the standard written form of English. There you should have, you would have to write, I do not like it. So don't is vernacular for everyday communication. Do not is the standard national language of the United Kingdom. Then in some contexts, there may be specific jargons. Jargon is a language or a variety of a language that is specific in some profession or in some group. So jargon usually has special vocabulary or has specific vocabulary that only people from within this profession would understand and other people may not understand it. So society or societies also use different languages. Speaking of that standard language, the standardized national language, one pretty extreme example is standard French. French, the national language, official language, not only of France, but also part of Switzerland, uh, Belgium, and Canada, and some other countries. French has a very strong body called the Académie Française, which you can compare to the Myanmar Pue of the Myanmar government or former government. So the Académie Française is the body, is the institution that tells people how to speak French, how not only to write French properly, but also what words to use, just how to speak real prescriptive linguistics. So the thing I'm using now for this online conference, and some of you may also be using, 
is called computer in English. Computer in Burmese is computer, in Burmese is computer, in Thai it's computer. So it's just the same word everywhere, basically in the world, but not in French. The French, the Académie Française, tells people not to call this uh, computer as it would be in French, but it's ordinateur. So you use a word that looks more French instead of the international computer. So the French should not take the English loan word, but they use something indigenous, something which they think is real French. Now, of course, the English computer itself is a loan from French. This came into English in another meaning, of course, hundreds of years ago. But French now has a new word, ordinateur. Now, if you want to watch videos or listen to songs, you usually download them from the internet in English. And also in Burmese, you would download sway or download low or just download it. So download again is pretty international. You do this in most languages. Not so in French. In French, you call it télécharger. Télé is the word that you know from telephone, for example. And charger means to charge. You know this from Burmese, you charge your battery, you charge your phone. So again, the French use their own word. And the date. All these words, these English words, are used in most languages or in many, many languages around the world including Burmese. You speak of desktop and keyboard and email and update, also in Burmese. But in French, they use bureau, clavier, courriel, and mise à jour for these expressions. So the French, the Académie Française, tries, tries very hard to create a French identity by using words that sound different from English. So all these words, are used to express French identity through the French standard language. So this is a very strong example of how language can be used to create identity or to show identity. Now, we do have those standard languages there is also in most cases a written standard language, a standard orthography. There are ways how to write a language. Now, is that something necessary? Is it useful to have rules of how to write words? Or would it be easier, better if everyone just writes the way they like? Well, actually, it's useful to have a standard written form of a language because written communication is easier if we have fixed rules we can stick to. First, if we have a written form, then we can get over dialect or regional differences. People speak differently in different dialects. And this is the case in also English varieties so this word, C-A-N apostrophe T, is pronounced can't in British English and can't in American English. But it's written the same way. So if you write it like this, both Americans and English would understand. If everyone writes the way they like, this may become more difficult. In some varieties of English, this is pronounced as can't. So that gets even more difficult. So regional differences uh, can be, uh, well, written over by a standard language. The written standard also helps to make the language more stable over time. So it's easier for us to read texts that were written 100 years ago because the pronunciation changed in a hundred years. 
And if people kept writing things differently all the time, we had much more difficulties in reading literature from 100 or 200 years ago. Then very important, having rules makes it easier to read and write. First, when you read a language, especially if you read a language that you can read fluently, you don't read single letters, but you read the whole words. So if you have words, you don't go for old W-O-R-D-S, how to pronounce this, but you see this as a unit and you just think the sound words. So this only works, of course, if there is some standard, if the same word is written the same way each time. Because if you see it frequently, it's more easy to recognize it. If the same word is written differently all the time, you don't recognize it as easily. And this would make reading much slower. And also writing would be slower if each time you had to think of, how can I write this? So it's good to have a written standard language. At the same time, colloquial spelling is okay if you chat with your friends, because your friends probably speak the same variety as you do, or they know the variety you speak. So that's okay then. If you have the same background, if you have the same conventions, then colloquial spelling is okay in chats. But this is for uh, less broad communication usually. So standard language, standard written language is a good thing to have. But then come back to my home country. Switzerland, of course, does have official languages, but there is not one language that is official in the whole country. So there is no language that we can call the language of Switzerland or the official national language of Switzerland. Rather, the Lilac areas here in Western Switzerland, this is where people speak and write French. And French, of course, is also spoken in this whole area here, which is France. Then in the southern part, the green areas, people there do speak Italian. They speak and write Italian. In the yellow areas here, people speak and write different varieties of Reto Romanche. Reto Romanche is a language pretty much closely related to Italian and French. It originates in Latin. It's spoken in some villages, some valleys in Switzerland by maybe 30,000 people. This is an official language of Switzerland and textbooks for primary school are printed in different varieties of Red Romance. Then the biggest area here, the reddish orange area, is where people use German. Standard German used for writing, Swiss German, used in daily communication, daily spoken communication. So there are four official languages used in Switzerland, but there is no common language. What does that mean? Now, Switzerland still does have an identity. Yesterday was the Swiss National Day. There were lots of fireworks, firecrackers the whole night. So people still feel Swiss, obviously. People are happy when Switzerland gets some gold in Tokyo now at the Olympics. And it doesn't matter whether they speak French or Italian, Romance or German. But of course, there are some difficulties with having more than one language. So Swiss passport comes in five languages. You have German, French, Italian, Romance and then English, which is not the national language, not an official language, but it makes it easier to travel if the passport also comes in English. So on the front page of 
Swiss passport, there are five languages. Also on Swiss ID cards, we have these five languages. It's always German, French, Italian, Romance, and English. And the same on Swiss driving licenses. So you see, if we had more than these four or five languages, maybe we would need bigger ID cards and driving licenses at some point. But this seems to be no problem. Everyone in Switzerland learn their native language or the major language of their area. So here you learn French at school or use French at school. Here German, here Italian, <clears throat> and in these areas, Romance. And at some point, people have to learn one other national language. So usually if you're from the German speaking part, you would also learn some French at school. <clears throat> And then you see all these languages all the time when you buy a pack of milk, for example, milk is written there in at least three languages, German, French, and Italian usually. So it's possible for a country not to have a shared national language. <clears throat> a similar case is there in India, of course, India is much bigger than Switzerland, has many more inhabitants, like 1.4 billion, as opposed to 8 million in Switzerland. In India, each state also has their own language. Hindi and English are basically used everywhere in India. And then each state has additional official languages. And you can see the road sign here in Delhi, New Delhi, for example. This comes in Hindi, in English, in Punjabi, and in Urdu. So you get four languages with four different scripts, even on road signs in India. So having one national official language is not really necessary for a country and for a society and also for person, it's not necessary to have only one language. Now, to have a bit of closer look at how language works together with identity, together with culture and thinking, let's go back to the beginnings. How do children learn a language? When a child is born, he or she does not have a language. A child does not speak or understand. They have is the ability to learn the language of their environment. So a child has the brain to learn a language, but it doesn't know the language yet. It has the hardware to do it, but the software still has to be installed, we could say. Now, in a natural context, a child just grows into a society and it has many social and cultural experiences in this society. The child sees different things, it smells different things, it hears, it feels. It's just all these experiences that the child gets in his society, in the family, in the village, or in the bigger society. And at the same time, the child hears how people talk about these experiences. So the child learns how to link certain experiences with certain sounds. The more frequent a child has an experience and hears the sound, the better it can remember these. And the better the child later can express these experiences with the words they have learned. So this is called entrenchment, something that you experience a lot, you get familiar with, and it's easier for you to do or to remember or to use. So the child grows up with different experiences and sounds linking to these experiences. And this then 
creates the language and experience identity of the child. The child learns who he or she is in the context of the family or the village, together with the ways of expressing everything that's around them. Now, of course, each child has their own experiences. Even in the same family, not everyone has the same experiences, feel the same way, see the same things, do the same things. That means the language a child acquires is different for each child. They all do it a bit differently. And this then results in what I said is called idiolect. In the beginning, children from different families may have very different experiences in getting different language, link different meanings with words or sounds they acquire. Now, later, this may be neutralized when children interact with more people in larger groups. When children go to school, some expressions only used in their own families may be lost because other children don't understand them. So as children grow up, their circles grow broader, they get more experience, they learn more language, and they learn how to accommodate or how to adjust to the language use of other people. They learn how to understand how other people speak, what they mean, even if they don't speak exactly the same way. And children will also learn how to make themselves understood in a broader society, in a broader group. So this is how children acquire language through experience. And experience then is reinforced by being exposed to different people speaking a bit differently. So language, identity, and culture are very much linked in this way. Of course, the more similar the experiences are of the children in early childhood and also later, the more similar their language will be. And you can observe this in people coming from the same family or the same village speak more similarly to each other than people coming from another village. So this is then how dialects may arise. And very importantly, if you have a lot of shared background, if you have many shared experiences, communication is much easier. You don't have to explain so much if you know the other person has the same background. And remember, I told you in the first lesson, when we speak, we usually don't say everything we mean or we want to say, because this would be too much. But if there is not much common background, you have to say much more than if people share the experiences. So linguistics expression is also linked to shared or common experiences, shared common background. This, of course, also works the other way around. If you use a specific form of a language, if you use specific expressions, with this, you can show that you have the same background as the other person. So if you talk with your friends, you can use slang words that maybe only you in your group use. So the way of speaking can also be used to define a group or to form a group. Imagine you're together with your friends and there are some other people around there and you do not want the other people to understand you or you want to show that you and your friends are a very close group. Then you may have some special expressions. You may have special ways of saying hello to each other or doing things together. You may also have special words that only you use in your group. 
So a specific language form can be used to set a group of people apart. In English society, this is not so much the case anymore now, but it used to be much more the case that the royal society, the royals would use a different language from other people. They would use different words. And when you speak of the royals, you have to use different words. So the use of language there shows a group to be different from other groups. Now, as an example, the big circle here, let's say this is a village where people speak English. And you look at three families in this village. First family, farmers. Second family, shop owners. And the third family, office workers. All of these family, of these families speak English. But they all speak a little bit differently from the others because within the family, they share a background. And as farmers, they also share a profession. They share a jargon. They have specific vocabulary to use when they talk about farming. The same for the shop owners and the office workers. So they can all communicate with each other. They all understand each other. But these persons speaking to each other use less words to say the same things in many contexts because their background is the same. When they speak with these people, they have to explain more. It's more difficult. It takes more energy, more words to make themselves understood. So each of these families share the knowledge of their social group as a family. They share the background of their profession and they share the language, the vocabulary and special expressions. Now, their language use with their language, they encode their specific culture in a way. They encode their belonging together as a family. And they also show with their language the culture of their specific profession. Now, of course, if family one here, the farmers give up farming and they maybe do something else, they become bus drivers. At some point in the beginning, they will still remember the language and the culture of farming, but maybe they don't pass it on to their children. So their children may not know the language of farming anymore. And if this is not part of their language anymore, then of course, this part of the culture may be lost in the next, in the following generations. So all these specific sociolects or ideolects not only are used to show how people belong together, they also conserve part of the culture. They transmit part of the specific culture or cultures, we'd have to say. So language, we can say, is a cultural depository of a society. The language is like a treasure trove where everything that the society knows is stored. Culture knowledge is stored in the lexicon, for example, as names of plants. People in cities usually don't know many names of different plants, but people living in villages know the names of these plants, and then they can dis distinguish the plants, they know how to use them. If you call a tree always a tree without making distinctions, then there is not much use in terms of culture. But if you have names for different trees and you know them, you know their properties, you know how they can be used for food, anything, this is part of your culture. So the lexicon of a language stores the cultural knowledge. 
And of course, also literature like songs, poetry, stories. This is all part of the linguistic uh, tradition of a society. This is all part of the culture, how the language stores culture. Now, if the people don't transmit this lexicon, this culture knowledge to the next generation, then part of this knowledge will be lost. Part of the society, the society loses part of their tradition. So language is a very important tool of human culture. In extreme case, the loss of linguistic knowledge and culture knowledge can lead to the loss of practical skills. So if you don't learn the words about food preparation anymore, imagine you live in a city like Mandalay or Yangon, and you live in a sound in a hostel, you cannot cook for yourself. Maybe you don't need, you don't use the vocabulary of food preparation. So maybe you don't make the difference, or you don't know the difference between cha and hla and yo and che in Burmese. Your parents, your mother probably knows the difference because in the village she does these things all the time. But in Yangon or Mandalay, you may just know Taminte because you have the rice cooker in your room and you buy the curries in plastic bags in some restaurants. But when you lose the, the words, the difference between pla and cha and che, then you may also lose the knowledge of how to do it, how to cook properly. This is also true, of course, for traditional medicines, for the production of tools, for farming, basically everything. So if you lose the vocabulary, if you lose part of the language, you lose part of the knowledge, and you may lose part of practical skills that would actually be important in everyday life. This, of course, also means that when the whole language is lost, the whole human pool of knowledge becomes a bit poorer. And we will get back to this in the final uh, lectures on non-national languages, the importance of also smaller languages. And just one more example here, how a language can encode social structures, not only practical skills, but social hierarchies in German, and many other European languages, there are two different forms that mean you. So in German, you would use du when you speak to people in your family, with friends, and then speaking to children. Then you would use du. If you speak with adults who are not part of your family and who are not close friends, you cannot use du but you have to use Z. In English, you use U in both cases. So there are both U in English. So in German, there is a distinction. There's a social structure, a culture that you use different forms to show respect. And this is lost in English. So if you translate a German text into English, you cannot make this distinction. This distinction is lost. Of course, for you speaking Burmese, this is very basic to have only do and see. Because in Burmese, you have many, many more possibilities, not only for you, but also for I. If you say na or jana or veda or what else, you can do this with much more detail than in German. But in English, there is no distinction at all. So if German should be lost at some point and English takes over, then this distinction will be lost in the language. This does not mean that in English there is no politeness. It's just that it is not expressed all the time. It is not expressed in the language. And as I mentioned earlier, 
things that you do frequently, experience that you have often are more entrenched. That means you get more used to it, you pay more attention to it. So if you only have to think when addressing someone, do I call him do or see? This causes your brain to always pay attention to this. So language helps form the way we think and we look at the world. Now, to sum up this lecture, we use language to express our identity. And this can be done without our knowing it. If we speak a special dialect, other people know that we are from a certain area. So maybe we do not want to express our identity, but we cannot hide it because our language shows it. On the other hand, we can also use language to define a group. I can show by my language that you don't belong to me. You don't belong to our group because the language I speak only belongs to me and my friends. So we can use language to define groups. Language is used to encode, to keep, to store culture of the speaker and the group, the society. And by storing this culture and knowledge, language is used to transmit it to other groups and to other generations. So I can share my Swiss culture knowledge with you by using language, but I can also pass on my knowledge, my culture to the next generation. So this is the important role that language has in societies. And the point that you may want to think about in about uh, how important language is actually for the way we look at the world. In many Western languages and societies, starting from maybe about 10 years ago, people became very careful to always use both male and female forms of words. So would we'll say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, not only good evening, sirs, as used to be the case earlier. When I speak of the reader, I would say now, the reader knows what they are doing and not what he is doing. Because if I use he, this is only male. So why do societies in the West now uh, try really hard to have not masculine or feminine or male female forms, but neutral forms or include both? How does the use of the language change the way of our looking at the world and society? This is something you may want to think about and how this uh, is also true in Myanmar. On Wednesday, we will look at Myanmar, as I told you, what is the role of language in Burmese society? If you have any questions now to this lecture, you're most welcome to ask them. Thank you for listening. So the floor is yours to ask or suggest. Any questions, any suggestion? Hello, yes. Hello, Sha. Yes. Hello. Yes, I can, can hear you. Hear yes. yes. As, as Sir, is, yeah, Sir explain the meanings of uh, international language lingua franca. However, however, I didn't know the meanings of lingua franca, so I would like to request to explain lingua franca again. Okay, okay, the lingua franca, where was it? This one. So, lingua is Latin for language. Actually, it means tongue, the thing you have in your mouth, but it's also used for language. And 
franca means free. So lingua franca is a language that is free for everyone to use. And lingua franca is not something that has to be set by a government or a society. It's something that just happens to be there. So English over the last uh, more than a hundred years became lingua franca for the whole world, basically. We saw last in the last lesson that Chinese Mandarin is spoken by most people in the world as a native language, but most people learn English as a foreign language because English is spoken everywhere in the world. So lingua franca is any language that is used by people speaking different languages to communicate without being bound to a specific country or culture. So that's why it's the free language, language of broader communication. Thank you. Okay. Hello, sir. Um, Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, I was, uh, what I found is that like now English is there, singular day to express. Uh, is is it in there? Somebody gender you have to you you should use a uh, singular day. So, however, I didn't find like this in my language for me. And so, um, should we consider uh, the same like because I think and you guys should. And you think they're really correct? Mm -hmm. In Burmese, you don't use the singular day because in Burmese, do is just used usually for male and female. Of course, you do have duma, but do you really use duma in colloquial Burmese? I don't hear it a lot. I hear do only. So do is neutral in terms of gender. But in English, he and she are male and female. They're opposites. So if you say he, that does not include women. But Burmese do includes both men and women. But in Burmese, there are other things uh, that uh, people try to force you to use the language in a way so that you think in another way. So what's happening in English here is that by using both forms or the neutral plural they, the, it is hoped that people will at some point see men and women as the same and not as different. So language to change our perspective on the world. And on Wednesday, we will look at examples in Burmese, uh, how some people try to change the way people speak and they hope that this will change the way of people how people think there are a couple of examples recent examples that we look at on wednesday thank you um, are there any other so questions i have a question um, yes. Is there, is there any exception for language loss? Yes, hello. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, now I can hear you, I think, yes. Yes, now I can. Hello? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, are there any exceptions for language loss apart from translating to another like? language loss without transmitting to another. To another, without changing to another language, you mean? No, 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 it's language loss, like you said. So language loss, we will look again at this in the final lectures. Basically, when a language is lost, it is replaced by another language because humans do use language. Humans use language. There are, are some cases where languages were lost because the whole people was lost, because the whole population was killed. 
And this happened in Australia and in the Americas where languages were really lost because the Europeans who invaded there killed whole populations. Fortunately, this does not happen that much anymore these days. So when languages are lost now, that means they are changed. The people change to using another language. And we will look at this in detail in the final week. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other last minute questions? If not, you can, as usually, send me emails uh, to ask, and I will try to answer. OK, if there is time until Wednesday, stay safe and good luck. See you on Wednesday. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Bye. I see everyone. Bye bye. 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 Okay, okay. I, I want to give the participant a uh, contact email. Oh, okay. <laughs> hello, hello, contact hello, I'm Malaysia. Okay, chat about ma, chat about ma, just now, mail to you, be that way. I mail contact hello, you have that way. Come here, just now, to go see you. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay, okay. Say I choose you, Okay, see you Wednesday. Bye bye. Okay, Wasia. Oh.